This is the sound of turning ideas into software. This is the sound of engineering and passion. Work. Work more. Work harder. Experiment. Build. Break. And build again. Write code. Improve it. Job done. Celebrate. Insurance. Finance. Retail. Defense. Robotics. Energy. Amethyx. Welcome back to another episode of Data Science at Home podcast. I'm Francesco, podcasting from the regular office of Amethyx Technologies based in Belgium. In this episode, I'm going to speak about online machine learning or well, online learning, which is a terminology that we have discussed a few times on this show a long time ago, probably. Um, and so I will give an explanation of what we mean by uh, online machine learning, also by real time machine learning. Um, and what are the consequences of this new paradigm, not so new to be honest, but it's a different paradigm of uh, performing predictions. What are the consequences of this to the infrastructure that you are going to consider to serve this online learning in production? And uh, especially in the last couple of years, there have been more and more people speaking about, for example, event-driven architectures or streaming architectures. And they are you know, some of them are even proposing them as the new big thing that we should be paying attention to, or they are emphasizing the fact that these new architectures, the streaming-based or stream-based architectures, are always better or are definitely better than what we have been doing so far. So apparently they have seen the light and uh, we have been doing all things wrong so far. <laughs> that At least that's what these people claim or are claiming. And so I would like to make sure that this episode is, um, you know, makes a decent job explaining what is good, what is not, and uh, also, you know, the usual realistic view on all these technologies when it comes to machine learning and, of course, data analytics and uh, backend infrastructure. So let's start from the beginning and uh, let's start from what do we mean by uh, online predictions and uh, online predictions and real-time machine learning. Now, when we speak about real time, it really depends which sector we are uh, referring to, because real time for some sectors can be very different from real time in other sectors. And real time for a company like Netflix is probably in the you know in a time for, you know you want to deliver a prediction in the time frame of let's say a few seconds, um, even a few minutes. You know it would be still okay. Uh, if you are scrolling the you know the list of movies that you would like to uh, to see next to watch next, um, you know the the fact that the system in the back end is learning from you is learning from the other trailers that you have been watching or the things that you have been adding to your list or the likes um, you know by analyzing these things in the last let's say five minutes it performs a prediction of what's going to be the next movie. That you are likely want to that you likely want to watch. Um, now, real time in this case is a few seconds or a few minutes. But if you think about real time for a let's say an autonomous vehicle that has to respond or take a decision um, upon the collection of data coming from sensors or cameras or lidar uh, cameras or whatever is going on in the, on the route um, around the car, well. Real time there is as a much stricter constraint in terms of time because, you know, real time there can mean uh, a few milliseconds, if not less. And so as you can see, real time depends where, uh, which sector we are referring to. And it can, be, it can be very misleading when someone says real time in machine learning because indeed it can be very, very different. Again, for a bank, for example, um, that is detecting fraudulent transactions, Real time means probably a few minutes. Um, of course, you want to flag the, the credit card as soon as possible, but there are a lot of things that you have to consider to perform that prediction. For example, the fact that you are not just observing the single transaction, but you're also observing other data that are probably more static with respect to you know the how dynamic the financial transaction is. Financial transaction, I mean, when you swipe your credit card, you start generating data. That data is processed and, and, and consumed by different servers in the bank. 
but you know to perform a prediction and to flag that transaction as fraudulent or not uh, well you need to be looking at other other data other things around that transaction but more on that later because there will be you know i will um, i want to take this episode you know step by step and there's a lot to to speak about of course a lot to cover and i would like to have an organic conversation around online predictions and online learning so generally speaking online learning means that you you know your model has to perform a prediction as soon as fresh data get in and not only that not only that's the inference part of the model but you also want the model to learn from uh, flowing data and this is something that of course is very different from you know batch processing the let's say the traditional way of doing machine learning which you have a model and uh, once in a while and we have to define what once in a while means that model needs to be retrained so what you usually do in the traditional sense of machine learning you would be collecting data for a period a day a week a month a year depending where you are operating and what's the time resolution of course but you collect a bunch of these new records and then you retrain your model offline and you know you do your tests you check that your model is you validate your model on a holdout set you check that your model is indeed better than the previous version or the current version and then you decide to deploy that uh, in production again and so from now on uh, you know your business is starting using the new version of the model that is the retrained model that is definitely better because you have tests that are telling you that in online learning this is not happening anymore because you have a model that learns in fact directly from the data that it performs predictions on that's where the online learning uh, is you get data you perform predictions and at the same time, you also, let me quote on this retrained model. Um, in fact, you don't actually retrain the model, but the model learns out of this new data uh, to behave next, in the next you know, data that flow next time. And this, this type of problems are you know, more and more common in certain domains um, rather than others. For example, Netflix, as already mentioned, if you have a new user of whom you don't have history, you don't have demographic data, you probably have only, you know, what you know from the profile of that user, like it's a male, it's a female. If they share the age, you can consider that data, data point as well. Maybe the country where they are uh, watching from and a bunch of other static data that belong to the to the user um, so you can use this but in fact there's no historical record um, or trace of how that user is behaving on the netflix platform i say netflix but i can say for every other platform out there in which there is a, a recommendation so think about buying books purchasing stuff online um, advertising everything anything that that has to do with the fact that users are interacting, are clicking, are behaving on the platform, and that behavior is, in fact, the input for a model to predict something or to recommend something. You know, another, another example is definitely things like TikTok, uh, right? In which, of course, you have a recommender that will, you know, enqueue uh, the next posts that the user is likely... Uh, you know, likely wants to see uh, because she clicked, he or she clicked on certain posts or they watched something and that input is used by the model to, to say, haha, since you liked this girl dancing while she was making selfies and acting on, on a movie. Hey, Alfred. Hello. So Alfred has this bad habit of interrupting me during podcast episodes and that's totally fine um, but you know sometimes it depends which sector i'm operating that can be critical so not this time <laughs> so let's go on so i was saying um the recommender of tiktok will uh, essentially take the um the clicks or the behavior of the user 
uh, and predict immediately, you know, there is no retraining, no batch processing of the model, but it immediately provides a recommendation for that user. And the same happens for the new user who just joined the Netflix platform. Since we don't have records, we have to perform a prediction. We have to make a recommendation. But, you know, a traditional machine learning model would say, I have no data points. I cannot make any prediction. While a online learning system from Netflix would say, it's okay not to have data points as long as, you know, we know something, we're going to deliver something based, of course, on the data that we have. That recommendation probably is not going to be amazingly accurate, but it's still something. There is still a list of movies um, that are recommended and the user can uh, potentially watch. Then, you know, that system will improve more and more as we use the platform, as we give some hints to the to the platform saying, ah, no, this, I'm not really into horror uh, or I'm not definitely not into uh, romance, Hollywood stuff. Um, and then the uh, Netflix is probably, uh, um, you know, recommending me documentaries, um, which is exactly what Netflix does <laughs> in my case. Um, oh, by the way, Netflix, if you are listening to this episode, I really don't like series. So, please stop recommending series. Uh, I don't like the fact that there is a season to follow and uh, you're going to hook me there. I honestly don't like that. So your recommending and en- recommendation engine is absolutely not working on that. And take this as a hint. <laughs> All right. So online prediction, I think uh, it's quite clear what an online prediction or what an online um, learning system can actually do and why we should be thinking of using these models, you know, this paradigm of of performing predictions uh, rather than a traditional batch processing uh, approach. Batch processing approach, in in contrast, they are, you know, they've been used so far due to the nature of machine learning and also due to the nature, well, due to the mathematics behind machine learning, and so the stochastic gradient descent and the optimization, the loss function minimization, that are all mathematical approaches and linear algebra approaches that better work on batches, right? That's why we have batch processing, not because someone there decided that we have to have batch and batch is cool. It's just because the mathematics behind machine learning works better with batches. Um, and, you know, we have been discussing a lot about this on this show about, for example, the problem of catastrophic catastrophic forgetting for deep learning. If we um, perform a prediction on just one record, um, you know, that network will have the tendency to forget what it learned before. That's why we use batch learning, because with batch learning, we try, we tend to mitigate the problem of catastrophic forgetting. So... When you meet an engineer who who tells you, ha, online learning is the future, batch processing is the past. Well, sorry, man, it's not like that. You know, there are situations and scenarios in which actually batch processing is the only option you have. And guess what? So far, there were many more scenarios in which batch processing was the only option you had. The fact that now we get excited because event-driven system, streaming system, uh, and we think or they think that they they saw the light and and, and they need to spread the verb as in the Bible. Let me be clear here. There is no system that is better than another. And there is no fashion thing that, you know, this is not a, a pair of pants that we are tired to wear and we need, we have the feeling to change it or the urgency to, to change to another color or to another model. You know, this is engineering, and there is a reason why bridges get built in exactly the same way as they were built during Middle Age, right? So, with this said, there are consequences. You know, the way, the way when you implement an online learning system, that new paradigm of learning has to you know, be reflected in the infrastructure that is actually serving that model. An analogy between batch processing and online learning uh, finds an equivalent for the infrastructure, and so for the data engineers, that is stream processing 
versus batch processing and therefore event driven versus batch system or batch based systems now of course if you are designing a new architecture from scratch and you also know that the type of, of models that you that that architecture is supporting or serving will be online learning systems well, maybe then you can design the architecture around that, you know, awareness, around that engineering decisions, especially from the data scientists who say, look, we are going to have an online learning system for the rest of our business. You know, all our, in our lifetime, online learning is what we are going to do. Eh? And, and there is no other way that, there is no way that we're going to have batch processing models, which is very rare, to be honest. Um, actually, it's impossible, but okay. Now, if you know that, and you are designing infrastructure, you know, immediately after what the data scientists have been telling you, then maybe you can consider a stream processing approach rather than a batch processing approach. And therefore you can design your infrastructure around that knowledge. In all of the cases, that's not true. And so please, please, engineers who are listening to this, stop proposing event-driven systems as the ultimate finding. We should all second event-driven systems because now we have event-driven systems, as if we didn't know it before. So for the record, event-driven systems are actually not new, are not new at all. You know, they are an evolution of uh, the so-called PubSub methodology, publish-subscribe, right? In which you have a, a, a data or an event producer and multiple, one or more, uh, event or data consumers. And so you have, you know, the consumers who subscribe to that particular channel and consume whatever is produced and published on that channel. This approach is called publish subscribe methodology. You know which year it was proposed? 1987. All right. I will provide you a link of uh, the SOSP um, paper that first mentioned something, you know, this methodology, or the, I, I'm not sure they called it publish subscribe, but it was essentially that. So, yeah, the closest definition to a publish subscribe ma uh, method as we know it today. It was 1987. So that's not that's nothing new. Uh, it's just that now there are you know things like Apache Flink or uh, Kafka. Probably Kafka is the most uh, well-known piece of software that allows you to you know that implements this publish subscribe methodology, and it's very powerful. And in certain sector, in certain sectors, uh, it is very powerful because indeed. That's the way you should be doing things. That's why computer scientists came with the idea of PubSub back in the 90s. Um, is it new? No. Is it useless? Of course not. It's, is it amazing? Yes. But proposing this as the ultimate novelty, well, that's misleading and also is very wrong conceptually. It is very wrong. So... Let's assume that you have a, an online learning model, uh, so an online learning yeah, model component uh, in, pro in production. What happens is that that model starts receiving data. You know, you feed the model uh, uh, with data and this data come from a channel, um, an API, a data collector, whatever. Now, what happens now next is that that model, since it's an online learning component, of your entire platform, it will perform predictions. So it will consume these data as they flow in, perform the prediction on the fly, also learn out of this data, the online learning part, and keep going. And then it will generate predictions online, and these predictions will be published on another channel so that the other consumers, for example, a BI or a Tableau or whatever visualization platform you have will start consuming these predictions in real time. Okay, that's what an online system does. And that's where indeed an event-driven system would be the best, you know, 
fit for such a scenario. But there are many other situations, and I could even mention the, the credit card, the fraudulent credit card transaction example, in which, yes, it's true that you have streams of data flowing in, but it's also true that to flag that particular transaction as fraudulent or not, you need, for example, the historical transactions of a period of that particular user, right? You cannot consider the single transaction to perform a prediction, to flag that transaction, to make that prediction. You need to be looking at a bunch of other transactions that happened in the past. For example, if I see that you, in the last 20 transactions, you have been purchasing stuff from uh, United States, Italy, and China in the same day, or in the in the time span of, of 24 hours, well, I'm going to probably start believing that your card has been cloned, that you are definitely not traveling around the globe to purchase stuff. So, you know, these are the type of predictions and type of input that you need to perform such predictions. You need an historical record of these transactions. You also need static data. Uh, things like FICO scores, for example, not necessarily a FICO score, but I said things like a FICO score. That's a very static information that is attached to your credit card or attached to your bank account or to your person or to your company if you have a business bank account. So you need this static data to be part of the input. So the fact that you are replacing a batch processing model with, with an event-driven model it still doesn't save you from looking back in the past and batching things again. I've seen it enough times already that, you know, this, this new fancy thing of having event-driven system, they have this, you know, they, they design these amazing event-driven systems and streaming uh, stream-based systems. And then what happens is that, well, they start batching stuff again. <laughs> Why? Because they have traditional machine learning models that guess what work with batches <laughs> so you have a beautiful dress outside to show the world that you are using this event driven novel systems but in the back end you are older than middle age because you're still going batch processing and you actually batch on time frames that are infinite time frames, by the way, because event-driven systems don't have a beginning, don't have an end. They, you know, data keep flowing indefinitely until you switch off the entire architecture, right? So these are the things, you know, these are clarification that we should be reading uh, at, and I would definitely like to, uh, to, to find this stuff written somewhere, uh, but I only find, you know, this... Uh, these big claims and uh, and uh, kind of creating new hypes and new buzzwords, uh, which is exactly what I'm trying to defeat with this with this podcast since almost three years already. Now, why indeed we don't see streaming based systems that much? Because we are all idiots, or because they are probably not appropriate as they claim they are. And, you know, I'm a very pragmatic person, so <laughs> I would go for the latter. Uh, you know, there are situations, as I said, in which streaming doesn't make sense. You know, if you are Netflix, probably does. If you are TikTok, it does. But how many TikToks and Netflix are there in the world? Thank God, not so many. The fact that 90 plus percent of the businesses that run machine learning models are batch are batch based it means that the mathematics behind and the statistical methods that we know since decades and decades are indeed batch based and we cannot change that changing that would mean having a different machine learning model would mean having a completely different statistical engine and completely different assumptions. There is a reason why, for example, models that are used in healthcare and, fi and fintech, you know, they can make damage if they perform uh, wrong predictions. 
And so imagine a, a, an online learning system that keeps learning from the data that flows in. Imagine if that data has poor quality or statistical properties start diverging from time zero to time 10, right? After 10 days, we start receiving different things, different data, different statistical distributions, because indeed the population is behaving different, differently. What happens is that your model, you know, that difference, that divergence is reflected from your model. And so your models start behaving differently as well. Now, in some scenarios, this is okay. Actually, it's, it's a wanted feature. If I, if I change my behavior on Netflix, and all of a sudden I, I do love horror movies, I would like Netflix to recommend me the best horror movie um, that, that I might be watching in the future. But in many other sectors, that would be completely wrong. Imagine in healthcare or in fintech, the fact that you are changing your behavior is probably because you are gaming the system or because whatever, and the model has to give you a prediction that is boxed, right? The model is as an assumption of the world that is very well defined. It, it should be very well defined. And the fact that the world around the model is changing does not necessarily mean that the prediction of that model or the behavior of that model should also change. So think twice when you are considering online learning versus batch processing. Think twice when you're considering of replacing completely your batch-based infrastructure with an event-driven or streaming-based infrastructure. Not always this replacement should be even taught, not even done, just taught. Then don't forget the, difference, the different mental shift that you need to reconsider your business and your machine learning models from a batch-based um, uh, learning to an online learning. There is a mental shift for the data scientist to convert, if possible, um, to convert a traditional model, a batch process, batch pro, a batch-based model into an online learning model. And also, don't forget processing cost. Most of the time, batch processing means that you can use your computing resources much wisely and more efficiently. That's exactly what the mathematics behind batch learning is, is telling us. The linear algebra and all the matrix calculations, the dot products that are behind a, uh, a traditional machine learning model are leveraging the presence of the batch as, you know, a way to perform computation in the most efficient way. This is no longer true when you switch to an event-driven based or an online learning based, right? And so you would start most likely wasting a lot of resources, compute resources, and that would of course, skyrocket the costs of your infrastructure when indeed stream-based approaches are not a good fit for you. These are my two cents on the topic. I hope you enjoyed. And uh, of course, feel free to drop by the Discord channel. We have an official Discord server where we discuss about the past episodes. You can propose new ones and you can even uh, provide me with your suggestions and uh, critiques, why not, about this show and these episodes and the past ones. Thank you very much for listening. I'll speak to you next time. You've been listening to Data Science at Home Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean to get new fresh episodes. For more, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit our website at datascienceathome.com.